If you are considering purchasing Allen Edmonds dress shoes, this video might just save you several hundred dollars. Today, in what is the most comprehensive review on the internet of Allen Edmonds, we will be exploring and assessing every minute detail of this brand's product to answer the question, are they really worth it? We are going to assess all internal and external facets of materials and construction, every minute detail of design, a secret section, other brands you may want to consider as alternatives, and a final few notes. These are the fifth avenues in coffee. These quarter broke Oxfords are a flagship product of Allen Edmonds. I have the Park Avenues as well, and we have explored those in my other videos, but in the interest of fairness and relevance, I wanted this review to be as recent as possible, so these shoes were purchased in June of 2024 and are completely unworn. Just before I purchased these shoes, Allen Edmonds has also raised their prices by almost 8% from $395 to $425. And lastly, throughout this video, I will be referencing several other shoe products in order to help better contextualize the assessments I'm making so that you can make an assessment of your own. These shoes are Goodyear welted construction, and we will talk more about the specifics of what that means as we proceed. However, there are three important notes to make on Goodyear welted construction and why people buy it. Number one is that they are resolable. So if this outsole gets worn through from you walking in the shoe, you can pay a cobbler to have a new sole put onto the shoe. Number two is that they are waterproof. Now, not waterproof in the sense that you should go step in a river in these things, but the idea is that there is nowhere water can intrude into the shoe through, for example, a stitch like they can in Blake stitch shoes. And the third reason is cork. Now I will speak more on cork in a little bit. So we are going to start off here at the bottom of the shoe with this rubber top lift here. Over $400, you should really expect a half rubber, half leather top lift, just because it's a sign of quality and craftsmanship. Moving up the heel stack, you have a second layer of rubber. Now this is very unusual, actually. I've not seen this before, and I'm not sure what purpose it serves. Moving up, we have two layers of leather board here, 425 that's pretty high to not have a full grain leather heel stack. There are shoes well below this price that are full leather. Is it a big deal that it's leatherboard and not real leather? In theory, leatherboard will deteriorate faster over time and compress perhaps less evenly than real leather. But guys, I wanna get this point out of the way because it's going to be a common theme through this whole review. At this price, $425, even $390, you're not just buying a shoe because it's functional, because it looks good and is comfortable, right? You're really buying it because of the craftsmanship, because of the high quality materials in the shoe. And now you might say, I don't care. As long as the heel stack works, I don't care that it's full grain leather. I'm fine with leatherboard. If that's your whole outlook on the product to begin with, that's okay. But I have good news for you. You don't need to spend $400 on a shoe if all you're truly concerned with is how it looks and how it functions. Moving up, we have the outsole. This is a full grain, vegetable tan outsole. Pretty standard at this price. You have a open channel stitch here. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the design section. Moving up to the front of the shoe, we have the welt. This is a 360 degree welt. The welt is a small strip of leather that essentially is the primary point of contact through which the entire shoe is connected. I found on my Park Avenue shoes, which I'll mention a few times throughout this review, the welt had a strange like softness to it. Uh, it's just not really what you want. You want like a nice solid piece of leather to hold the whole shoe together. This fifth Ave does not have that issue. It actually is a fine stiff piece of leather for that welt, which is good. And here in that welt, you can see the two stitches that connect the whole shoe together. And so the first stitch you have is this stitch here that goes down to the outsole. The second stitch is the welt stitch, which goes from the welt through the upper, through the toe stiffener, and then through the upper lining, which are three layers of material basically stapled together. So we're just gonna call it the upper here for the moment. So it goes through the welt, through the upper, and then through this white material you can see here. So this is gemming. Gemming is essentially a canvas rib, and it's effectively a T. The top of the T is glued to the insole, and then the bottom of the T, the vertical portion, forms a wall through which the welt stitch connects. This is 
Goodyear welted construction. And the Gemming is totally standard for this price, but that vertical space occupied by the Gemming creates a distance between the outsole and the insole, and that void must be filled. That is why cork is used in the shoe. So you would not be faulted for thinking from the marketing of a lot of these companies that cork is this luxury amenity added to shoes for the sake of comfort. It is not. It is a mandatory structural component. It does not even have to be cork. It could be synthetic. It can be a felted material. It can be leather. But let's talk about the cork. Do you see this? You see this little like, see this gap here? This is not good. Okay, this is like, really bad. So there's a couple facets to this. The first one is that you never want in the footbed of a shoe for anything to be loose or flapping around anyway. Even the smallest gap can cause problems. This gap here, every time you step on it as the cork rubs against the outsole will cause the cork within the shoe to crumble and deteriorate. And this means as opposed to the shoe molding to the shape of your foot, it will displace within the interior and cause you to be literally standing on uneven ground within the shoe, which is bad for your foot, bad for your posture, bad for your body, and defeats the benefit of the cork to begin with. But even function aside, from a craftsmanship standpoint, this is totally unacceptable. And you might be thinking, Christopher, well, maybe the bandsaw you used to cut this shoe in half delaminated the cork from the outsole. No, it didn't, and the reason I know that is because on the same exact day in the same session with the same equipment and technique, I also cut in half my Carlos Santos boots, which are also Goodyear welted, and the cork in those not only did not delaminate, but was not disturbed in the slightest. I know I'm harping on this, but this is a big deal. We're not even like a third of the way through the review, and these shoes are out. Moving up to the wood shank, this is actually a redeeming quality here. This is pretty good. Wood is technically preferable to steel because it will be a little more flexible. So the break-in period will be less intense for the shoe. The one thing you do want to see though, is that it's not a thin kind of fragile bendy piece of wood. You want something that's sort of thick and will hold its structure over time. And that is exactly what we have here. Moving up to the insole. Well, before we even get to the insole, I'm gonna point out this gap once again here above the shank and the insole, full leather insole. It's a solid thickness. Often you'll see shoemakers and cheaper shoes, they'll put like a thin leather liner, like a sock liner, under which they'll put some kind of synthetic insole, which can be okay depending on the price, but at this price, you really want a solid leather insole. And you might be wondering, why is the interior of that insole black? I wondered the same thing. Upon closer inspection, it turns out it's not actually black. It's just scorched from the belt sander I used to smooth out the cross section. Case closed, right? Well, then I started thinking, wait a minute. Why is it that this vegetable tan insole blackened from the belt sander, but the vegetable tan outsole didn't? And then furthermore, my Carlos Santos boots, the vegetable tan insole on those didn't scorch and neither did the outsole. Why did this insole scorch to black on the same belt sander? I don't know, but I have a couple theories. Theory one is that this insole is notably dry of a piece of leather. Why would they use that? Maybe because it's cheaper, I'm not sure. Drier leather means harder leather. Harder leather is stiffer, less comfortable over time. The second theory is that perhaps at some point in the tanning process, there are synthetic chemicals used probably to make the tanning process cheaper and therefore the overall leather cheaper. And it is those synthetic chemicals embedded in the leather that are actually scorching from the belt sander, not just, you know, the leather itself. Now moving to the upper lining, as far as physical properties, it is soft to the touch. It is clearly low grade from a cosmetic standpoint. You can see on the inside at the toe cap, it's got this roughness and it even has factory printing on it. There's defects with the craftsmanship of it as well. The stitching here where the panels of the lining come together, they're just sort of left unclean, like a loose torn cloth. There is bubbling, there is delamination from the lining and the upper itself. And again, this is totally unacceptable at this price. And that does matter from a functional standpoint because much like the footbed and the cork that we talked about before, just a little bit of bubbling and delamination over time that will rub together and it will quickly start to tear off the entire lining. The whole thing will start to delaminate. And then the heel counter at this price, you'd really want a suede 
heel counter, that suede backing helps just hold your heel in place. It helps reduce blisters. Moving now to the internal components, there is no heel pad. Even in high-end shoes, guys, you typically see a pour on heel pad. You might say, oh, well, that's a sign of quality because they don't have foam in the shoe. It's like, I don't know that I agree with that. I think if we're talking about like bespoke $2,000 shoes, maybe, but again, at this price, I want a high quality pour on pad to help provide a little bit of shock absorption in the heel of the shoe. People often talk about how comfortable Allen Edmonds shoes are. To be honest, guys, I'm inclined to think that's more of just placebo because there's nothing from a material and construction standpoint so far that would suggest in the slightest that these would be more comfortable than any other Goodyear welted shoe. the heel counter. This is an interior heel counter now we're referring to. It is a thermoplastic material. At this price, really would not want that. I'd really want a leather board. The scale is thermoplastic, leather board, and then real leather. And as you progress that scale, those materials will mold to your foot better over time and also typically last a bit longer. And then the French binding. So this is a small strip of leather that provides structural integrity and aesthetic finish to the top line of the shoe, which is the official name for this collar, this rim. You want to see at this price and even well below it, a nice delicate French binding that provides both the structure, but also a refined aesthetic finish to the top of the shoe. But here you have this material, I believe it's leather, but it has almost like a rubbery quality to it. And it just makes the shoe look cheap, how you typically see this on cheaper shoes. Moving forward to the toe stiffener, here again, we have a thermoplastic toe stiffener. That's okay at this price, it's even okay well above this price. You know, thermoplastic comes in different grades, guys. It comes in different thicknesses, different strengths, so on and so forth. It's just a really weak toe cap. I'll show you guys some video here of me like pressing down on a couple other shoes. I don't know if you can really tell, so maybe it's just something worth testing yourself, but it's just so weak that it's almost not worth being in the shoe. The more easily that toe cap bends or deforms in any way, the faster that that mirror shine or any wax on the toe cap will start to crack and shed off and look terrible. And especially anyone who's had a mirror shine that's cracked, you know how that basically destroys the aesthetic function of the shoe. Mirror shines are a little high risk, high reward. These shoes come with standard wax cotton round laces. The weave tightness is a bit loose on these and they also come with a bit of like fuzziness, like the, the weave is not tightly compressed the way you would want from a high quality shoelace. Again, it means it will deteriorate faster. You know, I'm not trying to be negative, guys. I'm really not. But so far from a material and construction standpoint, I would not pay more than $200 for these. And I can't say I'd be happy about spending even that. There are still better options, which we'll talk about later. I know it seems like, oh, I'm trying to tear down Allen Edmonds. I'm not, guys. It's just that bad. Let's talk about the leather. The most important material in the entire shoe is arguably the leather that composes the entire upper, the outside of the upper. And that is because the quality of leather is dictated primarily by its main function, which is to be aesthetically pleasing. And so we can tell the quality of a leather simply from the frequency and magnitude of defects that it has within it. Now there is comfort too, and we will talk about that in a moment. But first, let's just talk about the quality of this leather. You have wrinkling, micro creasing on the vamp. There's creasing on the facing, and it's not even just creasing. It's almost like minor delamination of the upper itself. There's scars in various places around the shoe. There's wrinkles around the top line on the heel of the shoe. The heel counter wraps around the shoe and then tapers off as it approaches the midfoot. You don't want to see where this heel counter ends. It should blend in seamlessly with the rest of the shoe. You should not be able to notice that there is a heel counter at all. And yet here, you can clearly see it disturbs the overall shape, the overall last, the design of the upper. Okay, we're switching up the lighting. 
Doesn't the world know that I'm trying to freaking make an Alan Edmonds review? Heck! Oh, the endless comments I'm gonna get. I run a professional show here, I can't even control my lighting. Oh my goodness, my camera's gonna overheat. All right guys, we're working on it, we're working on it. We're doing the thing. Oh. You know, you think I would have learned this lesson by now, but I don't want to shoot at night because it stays light so late because it's summertime and I don't want to be doing this well past my bedtime. Let's continue. Are my ties okay? People are gonna tear me up about my tie or something. And so those are physical defects, but there's also the matter of how the leather is finished. There's a burnishing on the toe cap. This burnishing is like clearly not done well, right? It's like totally uneven. There's nothing uniform about it. Several retail clerks have told me they essentially scorched the leather by running it under like a bench grinder with presumably a cloth wheel, and that burns the leather slightly, which gives it that burnishing. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, really it should be done with a spray dye, if I'm not correct, because not only does a spray dye help it become more even and uniform and therefore, you know, looks better, but you can see on this shoe where the leather has cracked slightly, you can see the color, the natural lighter brown color of the leather is already showing through that burnishing making it look just kind of broken and sloppy. Whereas if it was a spray dye, the dye actually soaks into the leather, which means if you have micro cracks like that, it won't show the color underneath. And then all over the shoe, you have what feels like a half-baked attempt at patinaing it. Patina, guys, is essentially color work around the shoe that you typically do to give a shoe a more dynamic color than just its natural color it comes with. It just looks like an afterthought. It doesn't make it look dynamic. It makes it look muddy and filthy, in my opinion. I mean, you tell me if you think different. Quite frankly, I think the color of the leather is nice. I think the color of this coffee, it's a nice medium brown. I'd love for the shoe just to be cleanly that color. And there are dye stains, and one of them pretty egregious. The thing is, the leather itself isn't even that bad. It's got physical defects, and they're not insignificant but no one's going to notice them other than you. It's a mid-grade leather, which isn't ideal for this price, but is okay. The problem is that the finishing is so bad that I would squarely consider this low-grade leather and wouldn't expect to pay more than $200 for it. I feel bad. I feel like people are gonna be like, oh, well, he's just angry all the time. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know, guys. I don't, there's, I, I had, there's nothing good. I mean, this is really rough. Now, what's not rough is the comfort. Leather on higher-end shoes typically has a break-in period, but these don't. So the leather is very soft and there's basically no break-in period for it, right? It just automatically is squishy and you don't have the stiffness around, say, the top line that you do in higher-end shoes where it kind of rubs against your ankle and causes blisters a little bit. The funny thing about that is that high-end shoes have a break-in period, not by accident, but by design. When you buy a high-end shoe like this over $400, you start to get diminishing returns in terms of like material functionality, right? A lot of why you're buying it is for the last. It is the model of the shoe, the sculptural quality of the upper. Over time, you want that geometry to hold its shape, especially because it's really complex. So you need a stiff leather for higher end shoes, and that's why they have a break-in period. But the last is so basic on these shoes for its price that you're not really losing anything by having a softer leather. So it makes sense to have it. So it's like in this weird backwards way, these bad material decisions make sense only because the shoe itself is already so bad to begin with. Like, I don't, I'm losing my mind over this. This is crazy. <laughs> This is 400, they just raised their prices. We're not even done yet. Let's talk about design. I have a Patreon now. I don't know if now is the right time to do it. I don't know if now is the right video to do it on, but I've always kind of had guilt about like making money, which is like not good 
you know, I feel like I, I don't think anyone should feel guilty about like making money if they're doing something honest or, or valuable for, for other people. I don't know. So like it never feels like a good time for me. So I kind of always just have to, I feel like my, the best solution I have is just to kind of pull the trigger when I, when I feel like, I don't know, to just pull the trigger. So maybe it's the wrong time. I don't know, but you can support the channel. You know, I love to become like a viewer supported channel. That's like, obviously it's like everyone's dream. And so I, I think that, you know, if you have a few extra bucks and you find what I do valuable, then you can support me there. It's not a product. I, I don't know that I have anything to offer like right now, although I'd love to do more in the future, maybe like a monthly Q and A. It's not, this isn't a thing for like, I don't want anyone who like, if you, don't, if you feel financially unstable, like this is like, don't, you know, I don't ever want anyone to feel like financial turmoil because they're supporting something I do that's like totally not, you know, the impact I want to have. So like, if you're feeling that way, you know, like, just the subscribes, watching the videos, liking, leaving comments, like that's awesome. And that's like a great way to support me. Um, and I appreciate you so much if even you just do that. But if you uh, have the extra few bucks laying around and you like what I do and you wanna see more of it and you wanna support the creation of it, then uh, you can support me there. Thank you. Okay, look. Design is so important, guys, because a dress shoe would not be a dress shoe if it weren't for how it looked. That's why it's called a dress shoe. And you want something that has quality in every facet of its design, which not only all the sum of which of all these small parts create a beautiful, elegant shoe, but they also indicate a high quality of craftsmanship. My candle went out. I think I yelled so hard that my candle yep went out. Come back. Oh, oh, no, it's covered in wax. No, that was wax on my finger. We're falling apart here, guys. We're gonna start with the last. This is a basic American last. When we talk about European shoes, about Asian shoes, often we see shoes with really complex geometries, and those are wonderful in their own right, but Americans in general don't want too much flash in their shoes. And that is why American shoes, much like Beckett Simonon and Thursday, Allen Edmonds and Alden, often have shoe lasts that are basic and reflect that. And now in some ways that is okay, and that is a style choice, but there are also ways in which that kind of makes for a cheaper shoe and a cheaper looking shoe. Now, as subjective as it can be to assess last design, there are a few more objective hallmarks we can look for for quality. Number one, we want to see asymmetry because that is reflective of the actual shape of your foot and will make for a more comfortable shoe. Now, it also adds a beautiful swooping curve that adds to the aesthetic quality of the last. We don't really have anything. I mean, it's almost not asymmetrical at all. The whole last is essentially just one big, very simple oval. Another quality you want to see is a specific sort of drop on the toe. A lot of shoes have this, and the reason tends to be, I think, because uh, if you have a toe that's too round, it kind of like I've referred to in the past sort of looks like Fisher Price chic. It's like a little bit like a like a childproof bumper. I don't think it's a great sign that it doesn't have a nice sharp angle, but I also, to be fair, think it kind of works for the overall last given it's just a very basic shoe overall. So again, I'm kind of losing my mind because it's one of these things that's like, it's not a good design choice, but it also becomes a good design choice because the design of the rest of the shoe is not good to begin with. The heel, you want to see a nice bulbous, round heel, not only because that's reflective of the shape of your foot and will help it mold over time, which will make for a more comfortable shoe, but it again adds to this beautiful aesthetic quality. These fifth abs, they're not great. I mean, there's a subtle rounding, which is nice, but it doesn't have that beautiful bulbous quality. I would be okay with this heel, maybe around like $300, right? Assuming the rest of the shoe is, is good too. I feel like people aren't gonna like my reviews anymore because I'm a little more expressive. Then moving on to the stitching, we're going to start with this little stitch here. This is called the stay stitch. It helps connect the facing together. So there's already a loose stitch popping out. It uses this thread that doesn't look like normal waxed cotton thread. It looks like it has almost like a glue that it's been soaked in. Moving on to overall stitching quality and cleanliness, we want to see a few common signs. We want to see uniformity. We want to see that all the stitches are tucked in. There's no stitches fraying out or loose stitches. First of all, already 
There is a loose stitch here on the heel of the shoe, just kind of flapping out. On the welt, there's loose stitches in several places popping up. Here on the vamp, you have a triple stitch. Now the triple stitch is just a design choice. I personally am not a big fan of it because I think it just makes the whole shoe look heavy and bulky. I'd much rather have a tight, refined, dual parallel stitch. The broguing as well, these are actually very well done. I think they're cleanly done, they look good. Then you have this decorative stitch here. Oftentimes it's just a beautiful gentle curve that reflects the overall curvature of the shoe. Here, it's just sort of this straight line that drops off harshly into the vamp. The stitching of it is fine, and ultimately it's a design choice that they're making. I don't think it's a good design choice. The whole aesthetic context of this entire product is that there's curvature going all around it. And in general, you want all the facets of the shoe to reflect that curvature in different ways. To have this line that's just a straight line that drops off almost at a perpendicular angle to the vamp just sort of disturbs that overall aesthetic continuity. Lacing graduation. So typically on higher end shoes, you will see the eyelets for these laces will graduate in distance as they go down the shoe. And that again, kind of provides a little bit of orientation here. They are just straight going down. And then let's move on to the stitch density. Having a higher stitch density results in a more refined image of the shoe. Now the stitch density of the uppers on these fifth abs is nine stitches per inch. That is pretty standard around this price. I would expect eight to 12. The stitch density on the welt is five stitches per inch, which is interesting because it's actually four on my Park Avenues. You know, I've said in the past around this price, I expect four to six. As you get closer to 400, four is really pushing it, but it's probably okay if the rest of the shoe is good. Above 400, I'm not sure I wanna see anything under six. There are brands under 400 that have six and even seven. Welt fudging is a decorative wheeling that goes along the welt of the shoe. It, along with a high stitch density, provides this beautiful top-down image of the shoe. There is no welt fudging. Over 400, absolutely there should be welt fudging and it should be quality as well. On this shoe, there's an entire segment shaved down to the color even is stripped off. Sloppy craftsmanship. This is a 360 degree welt, which means it wraps around and connects to itself. That connection is one of the few points of joinery, much like wooden joinery, leather joinery, you want to see sanded perfectly flush, almost to the point where you can't even notice the seam itself. Now this welt joint, you can see it, it does have a slight fracture here. The sole edge is pretty good. Perfectly flush, can barely catch my fingernail. This is in contrast to my Park Avenues where there's a pretty intense overlap. Unfortunately, that's not the only thing to say about the sole edge. There is literally cork spilling out here where the welt and the outsole are not sealed together. Totally unacceptable. Moving to the heel, the sanding is still pretty good here, but it is a little bit worse. I can catch my fingernail. The color sort of stripped a little bit at the seams. Now you want the heel block to be narrow, okay? You want it to be actually narrower than the width of the heel of the upper itself. It really gives the shoe a sort of aesthetic lift. When the heel block extends beyond the heel of the upper, it makes the shoe just look kind of big and chunky and heavy on the backside. Again, at this price point, I really would expect a narrower heel block. Usually at this price, you have heel wheeling, which is a decorative wheeling that extends around the heel block, a little bit of decoration to what's otherwise a plain surface. This does not have any of that. The heel layers themselves of the heel stack, you wanna see them even and uniform all throughout. They are warped, they're wavy, they're uneven in thickness all around. Then moving down to the bottom of the heel block, at this price, you'd typically see not only a half leather top lift, but you'd also see heel nails, small brass nails. They do help extend the life of the shoe a little bit as the heel wears down, but mainly they're there for decoration. There are none here at all. And then the gentleman's notch at the corner of the shoe. Some people actually mistake this for a defect. This is not a defect. This is really a relic of the past when men used to wear really long baggy trousers. This notch was cut to help keep their trousers from catching on the corner of the heel block. I'm not too concerned about it. I don't even wear full break trousers. 
but it's just a nice point of craftsmanship. But on the subject of milling, you can see all around the edge of the heel block, there's areas where it's beveled, there's areas where it's not beveled. It's almost hard to tell whether or not they're actually trying to bevel it, but either way, it's just not well executed. The heel block itself is lacking that beautiful concave curve on the interior that you would normally see around this price. Then the stamp on the bottom, it's a good stamp. The quality of the stamp is good. It has a good depth to it and it's even all around. There's no areas where the stamp is fading off. There's no sole finishing on here. Typically at this price, even like over $300, you'll start to see some kind of finish on the sole. And now it may be as simple as just a light dye, maybe even no dye at all, but some kind of gloss or a semi-gloss where the heel block meets the sole. It's just a bit rough and, and lacking the finish that I'd really want for over $400. Typically you want a narrower waist. This not only is a point of craftsmanship, but it also contributes to that beautiful curve here on the inside of the last where the narrower the waist is, the narrower this curve can be. Above $400, under two and a half inches. These are two and five eighths. And then these have open channel stitching. I would not buy a shoe for over $400 that does not have closed channel stitching unless there was something else notably exceptional about it. Closed channel stitching is not only a point of craftsmanship, makes the sole a lot more beautiful. It also helps the shoe last fair bit longer because that extra flap of leather will help protect this sole stitch, which is again, one of the two most important stitches holding the entire shoe together. And on the subject of the open channel itself, the purpose of the channel is to embed the stitch inside the sole so that it is not immediately exposed to the ground. My Park Avenues are pretty bad on this. There almost may as well not be a channel. These are better, but still, you can see the stitching is almost still level with the ground. It's not even as deep within the channel as I'd really want it to be. You might say I am literally splitting hairs, like the thickness of a hair, but the fact is that, guys, every millimeter of depth, every fraction of a millimeter, that can translate to weeks, maybe even months of extra life on your shoe before you have to resole it, depending on how often you wear it and in what conditions. So it's not insignificant. There is no sole bevel. These have a flat sole here. Occasionally around this price, you'll start to see shoes have a slight bevel here. Just complements the overall geometry of the shoe. This doesn't have it. That's okay at this price. The beveled waist, so this sole edge here, usually you start to see it around 300, a rounded curve here on the sole edge and that again, is a reflection of the curvature on the upper of the shoe, really just ties the whole shoe together aesthetically. And then lastly, the backstay, the way the shoe is finished, they've gone with this classic design. It's kind of like a fishtail. I believe it's referred to as a dog tail. It's well done. I think it looks good. Okay. Normally at this point in the video, I do a segment about imperfections, but this entire shoe, is imperfections. And I didn't want to spoil it at the beginning of the video. So I called this the secret segment. In this section, we are going to be talking about the redeeming qualities of this product. What good things are there to say about Allen Edmonds? Well, spoiler alert, there's pretty much nothing about the shoes themselves. <laughs> Return policy. It's great, you have 60 days, you can return it. Obviously the shoe has to be unworn, but it's very generous, they make it very easy. I'm pretty sure you don't even need the receipt, like you, as long as you have a traceable method of payment, like a credit card. Maybe you see this review and you say, Chris, I don't believe you, I wanna check it out myself. You can go, you can buy it, and you can decide if you wanna return it or not. In store and customer service. So on the list of brands I'll suggest to you guys and some of the best brands in the world, they don't have storefronts, at least not in the US. So if having an in-store experience is important to you, Allen Edmonds will scratch that itch. And the customer service is good. I can tell you now there is one Allen Edmonds here in Denver in Cherry Creek Mall. I've been to several around the country and my experience has always been positive. The clerks, the retail staff, the management, they're patient, they're helpful, and they're courteous. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of reason to engage with the customer service because the product isn't good to begin with. Widths for the people for whom it does 
matter, significantly so, Allen Edmonds does offer a variety of widths for its shoes. And there is no lead time. So many companies, and it is an increasing trend in the international shoe market, that you will have to wait anywhere from a couple weeks to a few months to get your shoes in. Allen Edmonds, if you want to go into the store and buy them today, you can do that. Or if you order them online, they will come pretty quickly. And in my experience, if I go to the store and I want to buy a pair of shoes and they don't have the right size, they typically offer to do two-day shipping, and that's really nice. And then frequent sales. So this is an important one, and I want to be very, very clear about this because I get comments on some of my videos. I read them in many other videos. A lot of people seem to kind of throw around in a cavalier manner this idea that, oh, you should just, like, buy Allen Edmonds shoes for $200 because they're always on sale. And it's like... Let me be very clear about the sales. There are three big sales Allen Edmonds does every year. There's one in spring, one in summer, and one in the fall. I personally have never seen the Park Avenues in Mahogany, their dark brown color, which is the one most people buy, go below $300. I'm not saying it hasn't, but if I haven't ever seen it, that means it's not happening with a frequency that I would just tell someone, oh, just wait until they're under $300 or under $300. And I'm pretty sure they only go down to around 300, like once or twice out of those three sales. The fifth avenues here do go down to 250. I actually did buy these for about 250. But to be honest, guys, if I were to peg a fair price to these shoes based on what you can accessibly get on the market, $150. That's, that's what I genuinely think these shoes are worth. Although to be honest, I'm not sure I would wear them at all unless I really, really had to because they're not good looking shoes. And that's the purpose of a dress shoe. It's to look good. You're talking about a shoe that is so fundamentally poorly made with such fundamentally poor quality materials that there is no possible interpretation of what this is that could reach even remotely close to the $400 mark. Now, that said, the purpose of this review is not to tell you to or not to buy Allen Edmonds or any other product. You earned your money and that is your decision to make. Fundamentally, the purpose of these kinds of reviews is simply to provide you information so that you can make the most informed decision and know where to get the highest quality for your money if that is a priority for you. Well, at some point I will do a more comprehensive comparison video in the spirit of providing you with more options. Here are a few brands that will not only provide you a better value, but also a higher quality product overall. For those who are buying your first pair of dress shoes or simply don't want to spend $400 on a single pair, Blackbird is a company out of India serving dress shoes for $150 to $250. But recently they have been a little bit flooded with orders and their customer service and lead times are starting to struggle a bit, so just keep that in mind. Beckett Simonon is a company offering dress shoes for around $200. They often go on sale for around $160 to $170. They have wonderful craftsmanship, wonderful details. They are Blake Stitch, though. I have a review on them. I talk more about why I don't think that's a big deal at that price, but if that is a big deal to you, then you may want to pass on them. I do always recommend them for first timers though because they do have a gratuitous return policy that makes it very easy to exchange for sizes or returns, whatever you gotta do. They're an American company. Mirman is a Spanish company manufactures in China. They have $195 dress shoes with a closed channel stitch. They have had some issues with stiff leathers, but it seems hit or miss and ultimately not too bad when you do get a leather that is a little bit stiff. Bridlin, probably the most exciting company under $300. They have a wonderful main line shoe. It's got great detail, it's got sole finishing, it's got a closed channel stitch. They're a great company. For those interested in the mid-range, the sort of three to $400 range, a couple great options. Number one is Carlos Santos. They run around $350, though I do have a code that you can use for 10% off if you want. They have solid construction, solid materials. They are most notable because they have beautiful designs and beautiful patinas that you would not typically expect until you get over $400, even over $500. TLB Mallorca. This is a company that is so incredible they shouldn't even exist. I'm gonna, we're all gonna look back in 10 years and wonder how this fever dream of a company 
even hung around. For $400, these are the best value on the whole market and by a wide, wide margin. Their Artista line is absolutely exceptional. If you wanna save a little bit of money, they have a great main line too. I have a whole review on them. Check them out if you wanna see every detail. For those who simply want a great dress shoe and are happy to spend even a little bit more than 400, you have Yearn Shoemaker for $550 is about what they're running at Arterton. Great shoes, great company. I have a review on them too. And actually the review I made, their workmanship has increased since then. So the shoes are even better. Now these are handmade shoes, which is part of what makes them so special. Ichigo Ichie is a little bit newer of a shoemaker, just an independent guy, Lee Trung is his name. Great products for the price. He runs around 550 to 650. Awesome company, awesome products, Japanese, check them out. Some final notes, I may do a follow-up video at some point in the future, but based on discussions I've seen around the internet, I anticipate a few common responses, and so I just kind of wanted to quickly address them here. This is a fluke. This is not representative of Alan Edmonds' standard of quality. You know, I disagree from what I've seen of Alan Edmonds' shoes. They're pretty much all this same level of standard of quality. I mean, you know, they won't all have the same problems or whatever, but like they'll all have about the same level of quality problems. You know, you guys have to remember, like if I, it's against the point of the review for me to show something that doesn't, that I don't think is representative of what you would realistically get. And even on top of that, I did have these shoes ordered to the local store and I had the store clerk look them over. I literally, I said, hey, like, can you just look these over and just make sure they're up to snuff? I wasn't trying to be a pain, you know, but like it's it's to be fair because I want to make sure an Alan Edmonds employee like sees the shoes because if they caught something and they're like, oh, we don't want this to go out because it's not good enough, then like it would be it, it would be unproductive for you for me to show that, right? It wouldn't help be helpful for you. Kind of a follow up to that, someone might say, oh, like well that's just the store clerk's fault then. That's not Alan Edmonds, and it's like I don't think that's fair. The store clerk is trained by the company. Right, if the store clerk looks over the shoe and they don't spot, you know, like the dye stain, for example, that's not their fault. They're doing their job, but that's how they were trained. They were trained to have that level of scrutiny about their product. Like it's the leadership of the company, you know? And I'm not just saying that just to, oh, like stick up for the small guy. I mean, it's literally true. Kind of on top of that, like, oh, this doesn't matter because there's a 60 day return policy and you can return it for any reason anyways. Like yes and no, you know, obviously that's a great thing, but also people wouldn't be able to see, they wouldn't know that the cork isn't properly filled in the shoe. No one would know that the shoe isn't even constructed properly. They're not gonna return it. And it's like, you cut the shoe in half, then it's not returnable. Do you hate Allen Edmonds? Why do you hate Allen Edmonds? I don't, it's a company, it's one of many, it has a product, one of many. Um, I'm just here to talk about it to help people better understand what they're getting if, if, they're, if they spend their money on. I don't have any vendetta against a shoe company. I don't know why I would. How did this happen? I thought Allen Edmonds was a great company. That itself is a whole nother video and one I kind of want to make because I think it's such a fascinating case study in like business cycles and certainly at least in America, I can speak for like normal business cycles. I mean, when you look at the business history of Allen Edmonds, if you're pretty, tuned in to like how business cycles work, especially in America, you'll understand that it's actually not surprising at all that Allen Edmonds is what it is today. It's actually, it's actually it would be surprising if it wasn't. You know, I, I think an interesting video would be one that talks more about like private equity and the business and how that accelerates, especially business cycles of companies like this and product attrition, vision attrition, leadership churn. These are all like really interesting topics, especially because I think that consumers being more aware of how those cycles work can help them better understand, better suss out, like, am I getting a quality product? Is this company likely to be one that serves a quality product? So really, really an interesting conversation, but not one, you know, for, <laughs> for right now. Christopher, I think you're being unfair or were incorrect about something. Great. Tell me. I'd love to hear. You know, I'm not here to tell you guys I'm 100% correct. There's like an almost, if anything's 100%, it's that I'm probably not 100% correct about, you know, the things I say. 
I mean, I hope I'm mostly correct. I certainly think I'm 100% correct, but you know, I mean, realistically, the purpose of the video is to telegraph useful information. And if something that I've said isn't particularly useful for like that goal, then I want someone to correct me. I want someone to say, hey, Chris, you're wrong. Here's why. Or I disagree, even just I disagree with you and here's why. Like, that's awesome. That's great. It's like what comment sections are for. You know, guys, I can't, I dress well can't, YouTube channels can't run if they were to take down a video every time there's like, a small segment that's incorrect and then re-upload the whole thing and do that over and over and over again you know so it's kind of part of just the whole process is like having people in the comments who share their feedback and say hey you know that wasn't quite right or that wasn't wrong it's like i invite that i invite criticism i invite feedback you know again like it's not for me i'm not making the re review for me it's for you guys so if you feel like there's something that I left out that would be helpful for other people to know, like, yeah, comment, like, that's great. Is this just a hacked attempt at selling your affiliated products? <laughs> no, it's not. There's probably some explanation beyond that answer that's important to say. There actually is a long explanation, and quite frankly, I plan on making a Doing a, doing a video specifically talking just about like review transparency and affiliate deals and biases and these sort of things, especially because now I'm like starting to get affiliate deals. And there's important things I want you guys to know about how you consume my information and like any information on YouTube and how you factor it into, you know, decisions you're making with your money. It's important for you to understand like biases and partnerships and how these things work behind the scenes. So I have a full video where I'm gonna talk more about that. The short answer is if I were just interested in making money, first of all, I probably wouldn't be doing dress well. In general, there are definitely easier ways to make money. Within the framework of dress well, it probably would look a lot different. I probably wouldn't be talking about niche shoe brands. Even within this video itself, like if I, really my goal, guys, was just to like push my affiliated products, like I could make this video probably and achieve that goal, making a much shorter, much cheaper, much less time intensive. I just hate the idea that someone would look at like all the work I put into this and all like how honest I'm trying to be and be like, oh, well, he's just doing this just to sell his products. It's like, <laughs> I wish, man, like, <laughs> you know, affiliate deals barely scratch the surface of, you know, the cost of making dress well. So, you know, again, maybe a longer conversation for that next video, but the short answer is no, it's not. I also, it's really important for me to be clear, guys, like, I make my videos the way I do for a reason, right? And that's because I'm not even going to pretend like I don't have biases. Obviously, I do. But the point is, like, I'm trying to show you my work, right? I have some judgment about, oh, this is bad or this is good for the price. And I'm trying to show you why and explain to you why I think that so that... Like, I never want, I don't want any of you guys to just trust my opinion. I don't want anyone, I never want anyone to like buy something because, or not buy something because, oh, Chris said it was good or bad. It's like, I'm here to show you like this data that, and, and talk to you about what my judgments are, but I'm not here to tell you what to think, right? Like you should, you know, do your own research even beyond my video, you know, but maybe my video included and come to your own conclusion. I don't want you guys to like say, oh, Alan Edmonds is bad because Chris said it's bad. It's like, does it like look at the video? Like, does it make sense to you? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's okay. Last note, this is just a last note I have here. I have it in the disclosure at the beginning of the video, but I want to say it again. Like if you have something you want to say, something you want to express to Alan Edmonds, there are proper and civil ways to do that. Email is probably like a reasonable one. But like, don't go into a store and like harass the staff. Don't give them a problem. Don't go to them and be like, oh, well, I saw this about your video, like whatever. Like if you have a genuine question, that's okay. But don't, you know, don't, don't give them a problem. It's not their fault. It's not their responsibility, how the shoes are made. Yeah, it's just, that's just not cool. And there's really no need for that. So yeah, anyways. I know that's not comprehensive. Again, I might do a follow-up video if I feel like it's warranted, but I appreciate you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys, even if you didn't watch, I guess. I don't know. Oh God, I don't know how to end videos. Anyways, so beautiful outside today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you soon.